Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. I see you are all muted, so we can't hear you if you're speaking back to us, but you are welcome to unmute yourself and say hello. We're gonna give people a few minutes to come in. So we're probably, we're just gonna give like about five minutes for people to head on in. Good morning, Anita. And you guys are welcome um, to take yourself off of um, the muted like visual, if you like, um, so that we can see your beautiful faces. Um, it's not a requirement, but if you would like to, you are welcome to do that as well. Um, we do wanna let you know that this uh, session is being recorded. Um, however, just so you know. I almost forgot to uh, put it live on Facebook. I'm doing it now. Okay. So we can say hello again to the Facebook folk. <laughs> All right. Grand Rising, Ashley. Good morning, Jahan. I love the Grand Rising, by the way. Me too. It makes it makes me feel good. <laughs> It's very powerful. It makes me feel strong when I say it. <laughs> Good evening. Hi. Oh, we have somebody from India tuning in. Awesome. Let me run to the front door. I think I have it locked and right. I need it to be open. <laughs> people popping in good morning again we're going to give everybody a few more minutes to get in to about 11.05 and it's still trying to go live on facebook so hopefully this works it looks like it's still thinking okay I was preparing. All right. First time's a charm. <laughs> so for those of you who just logged in, just wanted to let everyone know we are recording this session. Um, if you are uncomfortable with being recorded, you will still have access to this. We're going to post it online. So we just want to give everyone the heads up. Come on, Facebook. The lighting looks really good, La. Thank you. I tried several places in the house. <laughs> this is this is my spot. This is my to go to spot. Yes, I love that spot. It's just because everywhere else is noisy. <laughs> All right. Well, we got one more minute. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Facebook, maybe not. And then it's this new Facebook, so I really. Okay, I'm going to try to set it up from Facebook rather than from Zoom and see okay. if that changes anything. All right. Hey, Jahan, good to see your lovely face. Oh, she went back off. <laughs> oh, there she is. She's back. Hey, how's it going? 
Good, good, good. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for doing this. This good girl needs some 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 help. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I appreciate you joining in. Hey, Erica. All right, so I'm going to fool around with Facebook once more. So I'll hit stop live stream. And then try it again. Okay, now I'm actually getting a preparing live stream. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> So we could we could possibly like could we live stream? Oh wait, you couldn't live stream something pre-recorded. Obviously, that's a that wouldn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, worst case scenario, we will just post it there, like we did last right. time. Right. I wanted to because the option that they were giving me is to kind of like live stream just me, and I'm like, that's not that's not what we're going for, and what was supposed to happen. I did troubleshoot this, everybody. Obviously, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it's 11.07. All right, jump on in. Um, looks like we got a bunch of people here and waiting, so perfect. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Pamia. I am one of the co-founders of Black Girls with Green Thumbs. Uh, we've been doing these uh, video kind of sessions slash lessons um, in light of COVID-19. Um, for about two month, two or three months now. Um, they've been going pretty well, so thank you for joining us. Um, we were doing in-person lessons prior, um, but because of COVID-19, again, um, we're here for you guys in any way we have to be here for you. Um, and I'll let Latiana introduce herself as well. So my name is Latiana, and I am the other co-founder of Black Girls with Green Thumbs. Black Girls with Green Thumbs has been in existence since 2016. And uh, we really, really, really enjoy what we're doing. Um, just having the opportunity to meet new people. And then with us doing these online sessions, every time we get we do a session, we have someone joining us from like across the country, around the world. So it's been really exciting for us to um, use the web as a way to expand our reach and to meet new people that like share our values and our interests. So welcome everyone. And we are going to get right into it. Actually, before we get into it, I wanted to kind of give a framework of what we've been doing all summer. So um, this, what we're, our project or our program is called Green Thumbs in Your Community. And it started from some work we were doing in some local libraries in Philadelphia and in Delaware County. And then once the coronavirus pandemic um, occurred, we, as Camilla said, moved everything online. So this summer, uh, the Green Thumbs at Home, this is the session that you're in, we've been focusing on like garden theme classes. And actually next month in October, we're gonna transition into plant-based cooking classes, which we're really excited about. And those, we've done a few of those and those are really fun. And we actually invite you to cook with us. We provide the ingredients in advance. So we welcome you to pencil us in. We're typically the third Saturday of every month. And the registration website is the same, greenthumbsathome.eventbrite.com. So we hope to see all of you and your friends and family next month. Uh, I'm so excited about the cooking classes. Um, uh, you guys may not know, but uh, that's kind of like my background. I do plant-based cooking classes. So those are always like uh, one of my favorites and we hope to see you there. So um, today, um, our lesson is actually on how to reuse kitchen scraps um, to regrow food. Uh, Latiana and I um, have been doing this for a while, and we thought that this class was really important uh, because right now, uh, everything is about sustainability, um, and everything is also about reusing what we have, right? So usually when you think about gardening and reusing things, um, the first thing that comes to most people's mind um, is just like, oh, compost, you know? Anything extra that you have after you cut up all your vegetables, um, like from dinner or, you know, just... Uh, 
making food in general, um, most people know that they can be composted. Um, but about two or three years ago, um, I personally realized that you can actually regrow kitchen scraps um, to create, uh, you know, that same plant over and over again. And um, I found this out by just randomly being on YouTube and watching um, a video of a farmer um, in Western Pennsylvania that uh, only grows garlic and he doesn't have to procure any seeds every season or anything like that he literally just keeps regrowing garlic over and over again from the scraps that he has um, from previous seasons so i thought that that was um really important because uh i love to save money personally <laughs> um in any way shape or form that i can so if we can save money by reusing things why not right um so one of the other reasons that we wanted to do this uh class was because um uh, you know, with Black Girls with Green Thumbs, we're always invested in members of our community learning how to garden in general. And when you regrow these kitchen scraps in your home, you actually don't have to have garden space at all. Um, many of them regrow in water, as you'll find out today. So um, that's kind of the reason that we're here. Did you have any other um, things to add, La? Or did I kind of cover it? <laughs> you covered it. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, and. Uh, <laughs> So this cuts down on waste as well. So I don't know about you guys and where you live, but in Philadelphia, because of the pandemic, we've been having some trash issues, right? Um, that's been a really big issue. So the less stuff you have to throw out, you know, the better for the environment, the better for the community. So I'm just going to um, get right into it with you guys um, and list the common kitchen scraps that we've had success with um, when it comes to regrowing. And those scraps include um, your basic potatoes, um, any kind of common potato, whether like it's russet, white, um, there's so many potatoes uh, to choose from. You can also regrow from sweet potatoes. Um, you can regrow from anything in the allium family. So the allium family includes onions, garlic, leeks, shallots, um, anything that has that kind of bulbous look to it. Um, and they're usually very fragrant and delicious as well. Uh, you can also regrow scraps from celery, lettuce, cabbage, um, many herbs, not all, um, but some of those herbs include basil and mint. And my personal favorite to regrow from are the root vegetables. So this includes like carrots, parsnips, turnips, uh, and beets as well. I'm kind of, I'm messing around with this. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some benefits, we like to, when we're talking about like any of the foods or like any gardening practices, we like to consider and think about what the benefits of those methods are, the benefits of eating, you know, the nutritional benefits. So growing plants from the inedible parts isn't that unusual. As Pamia mentioned, there are some gardeners who garden um, only from scraps or what we would consider scraps. So like the cloves of garlic and they don't necessarily use seeds. Um, we've all, people also use scraps and we can consider seeds like scraps of vegetables and fruits as well. So some people will commonly use, uh, will save their seeds from tomatoes or, um, pepper. So they'll salvage, salvage those seeds. So I actually have jars of salvage seeds from my peppers that I've grown in the garden from years. Uh, I have, uh, my favorite actually are Thai chili peppers. I have some bell peppers and eat and then some ghost peppers ghost peppers can really look they sell for a lot of money because people like them <laughs> so i like to keep those many people can't eat them but um i i save those so i can regrow them every year um and as Camille mentioned while these can be a great money saver and as i just said they can be a money maker um when it comes to starting a new vegetable plot uh, they can help you save money on buying seeds every year if you save your seeds or you use parts of the plant, those inedible parts of the plant to regrow and create new um, and fresh vegetables. Um, another benefit is reducing, is reducing waste in your, from your kitchen. So you can make full use of the plant's ability to, uh, to grow by creating new roots. And it's really, to me, it's a very fun experience, experiment to watch in your kitchen. And if you have children, um, it's a fun process to go through that with them, to show them how, okay, we brought this 
whatever, maybe it's a potato from the market and watch how we can watch this potato or onion or scallion grow. We're creating new from old. Um, so my son actually is a toddler, so he is not as fascinated as, as I am yet, but I'm sure he will be. Uh, but I find it super fascinating. I tried to salvage some seeds from tomatoes a few years ago, and I'm not a fan of that. <laughs> Tamia doesn't like doing it either. That can be kind of gross, but some of you may not be as grossed out as we are by that. But there are so many so many fruits and vegetables that you can salvage and that you can reuse from your kitchen scraps. The possibilities are endless. Yes, definitely. Um, so just to piggyback really quickly <laughs> off of what Latiana was saying, tomatoes are one of the um, like harder seeds to salvage from. Um, and it's only because like, obviously when you open up a tomato, you have all of this like, uh, you know, water and like juice and like mushy stuff. So, um, and then the seeds are just like edible. So we don't really think about it because they're so soft. But um, literally like I, when I was trying to salvage them, um, when I had the patience to do it, I would literally pick them out with like toothpicks. And then there's the process of cleaning them and letting them dry and they're so fragile that not all of them are actually like usable so it's it's a lot to go through you know like so if you get some tomato seeds no people put put in work um to package those seeds for you but i just wanted to give you guys a visual um so this may not look like a lot. I'll put this up to the camera so you can see, but these are uh, green and red pepper seeds that my son and I have um, saved over, I wanna say like the past like six or seven months. Um, and you can tell we eat a lot of peppers because this is a lot of seeds. Seeds are really small. But um, again, this is doable and it is a fun project for kids. So my son, he's nine. He doesn't particularly like peppers, but he likes after I fry the peppers up, like if I'm making home fries or whatever, I'm like, okay, here's the scraps. And he'll sit there, you know, he'll pick them out. We'll wash them down later. And then he knows that he's going to get a chance to put them in the jar um, so that we can regrow them for the next season. So like Latiana said, it is a really fun activity. And it kind of gives kids an opportunity to know that, you know, um, my fruits and vegetables don't come from the store. You know, they actually come from a process process of you know someone planting them and you know growing them and taking care of them so it starts to turn those wheels um, in their head which is why we do what we do um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, how do we know when a kitchen scrap should be composted how should we know that we can use it to regrow something or how do we know we can reuse it um, in another way um, so for me, yeah, not, to, not to cut you off, but I think we're, we're assuming that people know what compost is. I'm, I'm like, we keep saying compost, compost, but we should, can, we should think about uh, or, you know, share what the definition or what composting is. Yes, absolutely. Um, so composting um, in, you know, the quickest terms possible is basically uh, reusing um, any like raw material uh, that is vegetable based. Uh, to create um, nutrients uh, for a soil that you already have. So for example, the compost that I have outside my house is just in like a regular trash bin with some holes cut into it. Um, it has soil. And um, when I have different kitchen scraps, I juice a lot. So I have like a lot of fibrous material from my juicer. Um, I will take that usually and put it out in my compost bin. It'll have a lid on top of it. And as that material starts to break down, um, it'll create like different gases and, and different chemical reactions that actually add um, like perfect uh, nutrients to, your, to the soil. So I use that soil in my garden and also in my house plants. And what that does is it saves me money. So it prevents me from having to go out um, to, you know, a Home Depot or a Lowe's and buy some kind of fertilizer. There's usually, um, you know, a lot of chemicals in it. You don't really know what they're putting in this stuff. It's a natural way to be able to like fertilize your own garden um, in your home, in your community, or even for, like I said, for your house plants. So uh, I hope that clears up a little bit about compost um, for anyone that wasn't familiar. Thank you. Um, Oh, no problem. <laughs> so going um, back again into the lesson, um, when you guys have kitchen scraps, when you're cooking at home, um, it's important to know what vegetable waste we can use for compost, what vegetable waste we can use for possibly regrowing, 
um, or just using for another purpose uh, entirely. So when it comes to composting, what I usually do is I buy um, and grow a lot of vegetables and herbs. So sometimes it can get away from me and something might go moldy or something like that. So if you look at um, a vegetable or herb and you see that it doesn't really look healthy or it looks like extremely wilted or really dried up, those are things that are gonna be better to put in your compost bin versus um, using it for another purpose or using it to regrow. And the reason for that is um, if you're regrowing from a kitchen scrap, you want it to be as healthy as possible. So you don't want any kind of like mold or any other, uh, something on it that can make you sick in the future or make um, your project not as successful because it's gonna be diseased. So if you see anything that has anything on it that looks weird, I would suggest putting it right into compost. Um, but if you have um, a vegetable that is healthy, that's a vegetable that can be used, um, like reuse. For example, we're gonna talk a little bit later about uh, making your own vegetable broth from scraps. So that would be one way to reuse it. Um, and again, also uh, how to regrow. And something that just came to my mind is when we buy, uh, when we buy produce from the supermarket, and you might be like very excited about doing this as a project and okay well i'm going to take the, these peppers that i have from the market and i'm going to use those seeds just a word of caution my phone is shutting down because it's yeah. did it get too hot yeah we can hear you we just can't see you one second Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can we can we see me? You're frozen on my end. Yeah, I just my phone shut down because apparently it's too hot. So I came on on a computer. Some I can see everybody's face, so that's exciting. Yeah, I mean we can see the still. And some people said Oh, there you go. You're back. Okay, you can see me now. All right, I spotlighted. I spotlighted my video. Okay, um, so some, what I was starting to say is that some peppers or some fruits or vegetables that you might purchase from the, uh, from the supermarket, they actually, those seeds aren't actually viable. So not valuable, viable, so they may not germinate. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you're saving seeds from, uh, from produce that you buy from the supermarket, from a regular market, they may not grow. Um, so if you are interested or you ventured into gardening, the best seeds to regrow from or to save in particular are those that you're going from, growing from home, home because you know that those are seeds that are going to reproduce. Um, and um, just to tie into what Latiana just said, um, a lot of the reason for that sometimes are the pesticides and herbicides that are used um, on a lot of the things that we eat. And um, that's why we love to tell people to grow your own when you can, because you obviously have control over how that um, fruit, vegetable, or herb is grown. You know what's put on it, you know what's not. Um, even when we shop at the supermarket, you know, we have things that have like organic on it and, you know, what have you. And, um, you know, that's kind of hit or miss. Like we, you know, we take it upon face value that these things are organic, like they say that they are. Um, but if you guys, um, you know, kind of look into the data, there's many organic farms that have run off from other farms that are around them that use like, you know, different chemicals. So um, it's just something to think about, um, you know, in totality about what we're eating and, and where our food comes from. So if we have a vegetable that has seeds in it that are not viable, that won't germinate, like Latiana said, that kind of lets you know that something's going on <laughs> with how that was grown nine times out of 10. Um, so again, that's one of the reasons that I personally save seeds because I know that the seeds that I'm saving um, are probably going to be uh, viable and able to uh, reproduce and, uh, and grow a fruit, a vegetable, or a herb uh, from those seeds. I just thought that that was uh, worth mentioning. Um, so the first uh, type of kitchen scrap that we are going to regrow from um, are potatoes. And did we lose Latiana? Looks like she just started to share a picture of the potato. Um, so as you guys can see on the screen here, um, this potato is a little bit older. So that means it started to sprout eyes. Um, and as you can see on the right side of the potato there, you see a little sprout and on the left side as well. 
Um, so how we would propagate that um, to be able to grow a potato scrap from it would be to kind of slice off where that eye is. And um, usually potatoes will have like an indentation so you could see where that eye is even if um, it hasn't started to sprout from it yet. And what you would do is kind of cut that off and you would let that potato dry overnight, usually depending upon the temperature and the humidity in your home. You would let it dry out overnight, maybe a day, 24 hours or 48 hours, let it get really, really dry. Um, and when that happens, um, you can place them directly in soil with that eye facing up that has the little sprouts growing from it. And then it'll start to grow like leaves and it'll start to actually, um, you know, the roots will start to form and um, the potato will start to grow a normal potato plant um, from that. So it's a really interesting process to watch. Um, I've done it before with children in a classroom setting. Um, usually their minds are kind of blown by it. They kind of think it's like alien-like <laughs> almost, but um, with all of these kitchen scraps, I, we've always thought it was really um, an interesting process to watch if you've never done it before. Um, and again, this is really cool because it's gonna save you money and save you time by not having to go out and uh, buy seeds if you plan on uh, growing potatoes for your own uh, family to consume. So the next plant that we're going to go over is sweet potatoes. So um, sweet potatoes and potatoes, though they share a name, they grow a little differently. Um, I have one here that has some, that started to develop some, some roots. So I have two old ones. I've actually been saving them because I knew that this class was coming up. So I've been letting as many as I can like develop some roots. What you can do to, uh, to reuse your sweet potato is you can cut the sweet potato in half or you can keep it as is, especially if it's a smaller one, and you can place toothpicks on either like around the potato, the sweet potato. So I would say like four toothpicks and you can sit it in a glass jar with some water and uh, make sure that the bottom half um, not the one with the roots, is touching the water and it'll start to develop some roots and then it will eventually continue to sprout. Uh, we've been growing sweet potatoes. I'm growing sweet potatoes in the front of my house and at our library garden in Darby, we're growing sweet potatoes and they, uh, they are beautiful vining plants. So what we see here, they'll eventually, they will grow out and turn into the vines. And then of course the sweet potatoes are root vegetables. So uh, we will be developing roots for the uh, sweet potatoes to grow from if you were gonna regrow from a sweet potato like this. And what I've learned over the past few years from my neighbors is that some people actually eat the sweet potato vine. So if we're thinking about saving money and using the totality of a plant, a sweet potato, you can eat both the root and the leaves from the, um, from the vines. And uh, they're commonly cooked in uh, different African cultures, different countries of Africa, and they make them a lot of different ways, but they wilt and they're similar to, let's say, like how you might uh, cook spinach or other leafy greens. They're also really beautiful. Uh, we have some sweet potato vines growing in our Darby library currently. And um, like, I guess if I didn't know anything about gardening, I would just be like, oh, that's some nice like foliage like around there. But I just love sweet potato vines because again, like it can cover like an area really nicely without, even when it's overgrown, it still looks beautiful. So if you're looking for like a plant to grow that's really highly nutritious, you can eat all parts of it. Um, and it looks beautiful, sweet potato <laughs> is kind of where it's at. And you will, and you may notice that they, there are some uh, sweet potato vines that are used for like, just for like their prettiness. So just for foliage in the garden, they're not necessarily edible. Um, they tend to be purple. So you can, you'll see some potatoes, some vining plants that people use in uh, aesthetically in gardens. Yes. Uh, so the next types of uh, plants we're going to be talking about today are my personal favorite. Latiana knows I hype them up all the time. Um, so that's the allium family. And that includes those bulbous uh, root vegetables like the onions, the shallots, the leeks, uh, and the garlics um, as well. So that's not all encompassing. I'm sure there's like a few other species that I'm missing that may not be uh, something that Americans eat, but those are the ones that we eat in this country. Um, so today I have just your basic um, yellow onion um, to kind of give you guys a visual of that. 
Um, so the way that we would propagate and regrow um, from a piece like this, so I'm gonna kind of put this towards the camera so you can see it. So this is the, um, this is like that, uh, the base and the bulb uh, part. So this is the part that we would cut off probably about a half an inch to an inch of. And again, this would be like an unpeeled um, version of the onion here. And all you would do is place that into a shallow dish of water. So if I was regrowing this at home today, I have like a little clear uh, Tupperware here with a half an inch of water in it. Um, I would place that um, directly into the water here. And um, honestly, rather quickly, uh, anything in the Allium family is gonna start to sprout uh, within maybe two or three days. Um, one thing you wanna make sure you do though is change the water very often. And by very often, I mean at least once daily because what'll happen if you don't is it'll just rot. You know, it'll start to break down, it'll attract flies, it won't look pretty, it'll be very stinky um, and it'll ruin your project. So uh, changing the water is gonna be really, really important. Um, and you wanna make sure that the water, um, it covers the roots, but not the top. So um, I'm actually going to show you guys really quickly a visual of that. So I'm just gonna cut this. Like I said, that gives us about a half an inch here, all the way around. And I hope I don't have too much water in here. If I do, I'll pour a little bit out. Placing it in here. Put a little bit more water in. And this will be the start of regrowing a scrap from uh, a yellow onion. So it's pretty simple, it's pretty easy. And um, it's really doable for like a family um, to try to, uh, you know, do a quick uh, science lesson for you and your children and just to see how it works. Um, so it's a bit different. Another, sorry, mm -hmm. just want to say another um, plant in the Allium family that is pretty easy to regrow are the scallions. And they're actually a different, you kind of like, you turn them in the water a different way. Whereas from the onions, you're trying to regrow the roots from I guess what would be considered the inside of the onion and allowing the roots to grow up. With a scallion, you would regrow those from the bulb itself in the water and the roots would grow from the water, uh, would grow from the base of the plant that's in the water. Um, so also, so for anyone that actually wants to regrow these um, in the garden, um, there's another way you can do it. So this is if you want to do it like from the inside of your home, it's really easy to place them directly in the water and to do it that way. But if you have garden space or even like a small pot with soil um, in your home, you can also follow those same exact rules. But instead of placing them in the water, you can place them directly into the soil um, and then place water right on top of it. And you would have uh, hopefully the same results. And I feel like it's worth mentioning that, again, like anytime you're regrowing from a kitchen scrap, it's always um, experimental. So it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, 100% uh, it's going to grow or regrow. Chances are that it will if you follow the directions properly. Um, and again, you're starting with um, a vegetable or an herb that is healthy. Um, but, you know, it can be hit or miss, you know, there's so many variables when it comes to doing a scientific experiment that it's just something to consider. So the next, um, the next vegetable that we're going to spotlight is celery. And we'll actually end up showing this, this picture twice. So celery is on the, is the bottom right. And celery is one of the easiest plants to regrow from scraps. You can simply cut off the bottom of the celery and place it in a shallow dish, like how we have displayed here in this photo. Um, with a little warm water at the bottom and the bowl should be kept in a sunny and relatively warm place and that's typically the rules for uh, all of these uh, regrowing plants that we're um, giving you examples of you want it just like with any plant you want to ensure that the plant has access to sun and clean water after about a week or so uh, the leaves will begin to grow and you can wait and harvest these as required or replant the celery in your in your garden and allow it to grow to a full-size plant 
there was somebody on Facebook who said they started the celery experiment and they have about like two inch leaves already after a few days. Yeah, they grow really, really fast. <laughs> Did so. you end up, because you started doing some celery this year, did you end up putting any in the garden? Yeah, I did. So my celery um, experiment was half successful, I would say. So I think I started out with like four to six of them, um, mm -hmm. you know, growing them from the scraps. I placed them as they regrew up into about maybe two or three inches. I placed them in some uh, pots inside my home. They were growing really well. I watered them. They had started to root. Um, they started to get larger and larger. So I said, let's put them outside. And of course, as they went outside, the squirrels came and got them. So I did to, you know, complete my experiment um, totally, but I do know that it works, you know what I mean, for sure. Um, and just for anybody that's listening right now, um, you don't have to ever put the celery uh, regrow scraps outside. If you like to, you can just keep, uh, sorry, keep clipping um, the greens that are growing and it will just keep growing and growing and growing, I guess, until, you know, the plant burns out. I'm not really sure how long that would take, but it would take a while. You would have access to them for, you know, weeks, if not months um, of constant uh, fresh greenery, just from inside your home, inside your windowsill. So celery is one of those plants that is super easy to regrow from uh, when it comes to transplanting them outdoors it does get a little bit more tricky um, but if you just want to do it from the inside of your home uh, it's very easy and very valuable uh, so uh, moving on from celery um, the next types of vegetables that we're talking about again these are root vegetables uh, carrots parsnips beets turnips, things of that nature. So I have um, a visual for you guys here today. I'm really excited because in most supermarkets, we don't really always get to see um, root vegetables, especially carrots with the tops that are still left on them. Um, these are some really cute organic uh, carrots that I found at Whole Foods this morning um, that are really healthy and have the tops um, still on them. So I just wanted to give you all um, a quick visual of those. Um, so with these kind of root vegetables, um, usually if anybody has ever worked um, in food service or the restaurant industry, like you know that a lot of people at home don't eat those tops, but um, they can be used for like soups. A lot of uh, chefs use them for garnish and things like that. They're usually pretty bitter, so not everyone loves the taste of them, but they are really highly nutritious. Um, I always talk about like magnesium and iron content and dark leafy green vegetables. Um, and those carrot uh, tops are a really good example of that. Uh, for me personally, I know like I had always struggled with like uh, anemia and having like low iron and things like that so and that's a lot of that's an issue that a lot of uh, women of color have and women also in general so if that's something that you struggle with that's something that you want to uh, start to incorporate into your diet um, so in terms of regrowing these kitchen scraps um, what you can do um, is just like in the allium family we talked about the onions and the garlic and the leeks um, what you would do is you would cut off that top part, giving it about a half an inch or an inch. Um, you can cut it off and I'm gonna do that again for you guys now so you can see a visual. And again, we're gonna be leaving that really beautiful like top leafy green stuff on there. Um, and you're gonna be placing them into a bowl of water that has about, uh, again, a half of an inch of shallow water in there. So the cut side is going to be down and the leaf side um, is going to be up. So even if um, your plant doesn't already have um, this beautiful foliage on top, um, it will start to then grow um, that, that dark leafy green foliage out of it as you um, have it sit for maybe about seven to 10 days. Um, depending on you know the humidity and how uh, quickly you change the water again more, the more times you change your water the healthier um, the plant is going to be um, and that's uh, pretty much it for the carrot turnip uh, parsnip group. And I also have a visual for ginger 
So a while ago, I bought a lot of ginger from Produce Junction, and I've just been watching them very fascinated, uh, being very fascinated as they start to sprout. So ginger isn't technically a, while it grows underground, it's not technically a root vegetable, um, but it's a rhizome. For, what is that? <laughs> it's considered a rhizome. Yes, a rhizome. So that means that like these from the root of the plant, the ginger actually like creates like a bulb out on the side of the root. Um, but for simplicity, we tend, people tend to uh, place ginger in the root vegetable family. So I just wanted to show you how ginger looks when it sprouts. And you can regrow ginger at home, but ginger typically grows in a more uh, warm and warm climate and it takes a long time to grow. So if you regrow it at home, you'll get a nice, pretty, fragrant houseplant. Um, and I think that's worthwhile as well. Uh, as you can see, both me and I are uh, houseplant mamas as well as Black Girls with Green Thumbs edible plants. <laughs> so you can also, that's one of, so that's my plan for uh, these ginger roots that I've regrown. I'm gonna try to do a houseplant for one of those. And, thank you. And to do that, you would place this, uh, the scrap. So I would like cut off a piece of the bulb and place it in about one inch deep of soil rather than water uh, because we want to give it the like the actual growing medium so it would grow for a while since we know that our intent is to do it like as a house plant. Um, the next group of vegetables that we are going to go into is the leafy greens. So that's like lettuce, bok choy, uh, you know, collard greens and stuff, but those you don't necessarily, you won't regrow scraps from collard greens. So I'm just trying to give you an example of what other leafy greens are. Uh, so I told you we were going to revisit this photo that we have that had the celery. So on the left is romaine lettuce. And so this is actually a photo that of some of Famia's experiments that we had taken into class uh, in the winter. So this is one of Pamia's celeries that lasted a little while. <laughs> and how long did your romaine last? So that romaine I kept growing from for about two months before I decided to put it in the soil and it died when I placed it in the soil. But um, it had such healthy shoots. Um, again, like Latiana mentioned um, with the celery, um, that, that romaine lettuce kind of follows those same guidelines. But I changed the water, you know, every day. Um, it was sitting in the windowsill, so it got adequate sunlight. Um, that's another um, important thing. Um, and I honestly feel like it might still be growing right now if I never placed it in the soil. So um, I'm just saying I've had really, really good success with growing it in water. So what, if you remember, because I remember when you were transplanting some of these, we had a cold snap. It had gotten really warm. And that encouraged us to put some of our plants and some of the seedlings that we were growing outside. And then it got cold out of nowhere. And you were like, last time everything died. <laughs> I was like, I tried. <laughs> You know, um, but that again, so for our participants, that's, it's not, it shouldn't be discouraging when that happens. It's kind of like the beauty of the process. So like each year and each season, like we always try different things and see, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and, you know, we're writing it down in our journal. So we have that information for next year, but we laugh about it. You know, like that's the beauty of being like a plant mama versus like a fur mama. Like, you know, if your plants die, you don't feel as bad, you know, as if you had like a real pet. So you can experiment with these things without the guilt. <laughs> yes. Um, so let me just give you a little more like details and facts about this leafy green family and regrowing those. Uh, as you keep hearing as mentioned, you can regrow the scraps in water and place them on a sunny windowsill. Um, and you can transplant them from water into soil as soon as they grow roots. Like roots is the goal for all of these. And uh, especially if your intent is to place them in soil, you want these plants to grow roots. So um, in the water or in the soil, because the root is a part of the plant that will enable the plant to access nutrients and water. So just keep that in mind that roots are the goal. Um, 
And when you're placing your scrap in the soil, you want to ensure that the soil is covering the roots in the base, base and that the top of the rooted scraps are uh, exposed. And as you hear from me say, you want to change this water daily um, so that it remains clean, doesn't attract pests, uh, and, you know, so it won't start to smell as well. Uh, you okay. can also... I'm sorry? I said the smell's the worst part, honestly. It'll get oh, back, back to these tomatoes. So Camilla kept it real light when she was talking about the uh, the particular, like how particular you have to be uh, with pluck, plucking the tomato seeds when you're keeping seeds. No, you have to rot the tomato seeds. You have to let them go through this whole process where the wetness is rotting and mildewing, and then you clear them off and let them dry. It's such a long, gross process uh but you know try it if you all like to experiment try the tomatoes you see that we're not talking about tomatoes in this at all we're just like <laughs> just anecdotal we are not saying regrow from tomato kitchen scraps interestingly interestingly enough like i always think about how okay so how does this like occur naturally like in nature okay. and tomatoes are like one of those things that like it can you know you can understand very clearly how they can like propagate themselves like naturally. So like, okay, let's think about me just being like a farmer and I'm like taking a bite of a tomato and I'm like, oh, I don't want the rest anymore. And so I just like throw it on the ground. And so like naturally it's gonna start to rot like in will and then it'll rain and all this, the conditions that'll happen naturally um, in the world will create another tomato plant. So that's why it's so particularly doing it inside your home because what we're doing essentially is like recreating what would happen naturally as far as like the decomposition and things like that. So um, it's just something to keep in mind, uh, you know, when you're trying these experiments. Um, so the next plants um, that we have on our list of easy to regrow kitchen scraps um, are cabbage. So La, I, I don't remember, do we actually have a visual for the cabbage? We, yes. Okay, awesome. So yeah, let's I remember for a second either. <laughs> I was like, I couldn't remember. Um, the visual um, for cabbage. So um, just like the lettuces that we talked about, um, cabbages can be regrown in the ground. Um, so what you would be doing um, is cutting off the head of a headed cabbage. And essentially you'd be cr cutting just across the base um, and you'd be placing it um, in the ground. So usually what would happen from that within um, seven to 10 days or a few weeks, um, depending upon uh, what's going on in the environment, a second head will then form um, from that base of that cabbage um, and it will start to regrow itself naturally. Um, so just like with the, uh, with the lettuce um, and even like the leaves, they can be regrown from that root um, into new plants. Um, so cabbages are one of those things that are easy, like they, they are in that, uh, you know, dark leafy green um, vegetable type category. Um, I love cabbage. I think it tastes great. Um, it's always one of those um, cheaper vegetables to make really hearty meals out of. Um, so if you're looking for something to regrow that's cheap to start with and, you know, going to be free to keep doing, cabbage is definitely um, something that we would suggest as well. So last but not least, we have herbs. Um, a wide range of herbs can be regrown using plant cuttings and scraps. Uh, not all of them, but a good amount. Uh, and we don't say all of them because some herbs, if you have ever grown herbs, or even if you're unfamiliar, some herbs can actually end up being really woody. So they wouldn't necessarily regrow well um, through these experiments that we are describing. So you can regrow them with what is called like a plant cutting. So you simply place a stem um, around like four inches long into some water and you make sure that the leaves are above the water level. Because if you have the leaves in the water, then those leaves will rot. So you want to really just be, um, you want to give the root of the herb the opportunity to create uh, other roots and then prepare to be repotted in some soil. And Pamia has an example of some herbs that she actually regrew from a plant cutting. Yes, so this is a, I would say, great granddaughter 
plants? Yes. So um, this is some um, basic uh, spearmint. Um, it's a little baby that I regrew from doing the same technique uh, Latiana just talked about. So I have some spearmint that um, has been growing outside of my house for I think like the past three or four years. Um, at this point, and um, mint is one of those herbs that you really don't have to worry about. You can plant them one time inside or outside, and even after the winter, like the roots will survive the frost, and when spring comes back around, they'll just come back on their own um, and be beautiful every year. You won't have to worry about it. Um, so basically what I did was um, I just took one of those stems from my plant that's outside, I cut it, like Latiana said, I placed it in a little bit of water, and then you'll start to see little uh, tiny white uh, roots coming from that stem, um, as long as you change the water pretty often again also. And as soon as those stems become to be about like an inch or half an inch long, you can then place them um, directly into some soil with a little bit of water, keep checking on them, give them a little TLC, and before you know it, you'll have another plant. So when I mentioned this plant being a granddaughter or a great granddaughter, um, basically what that means is that's just how many times I've propagated it. So plants, as we know, are like asexual. So what that means is, you know, when you have a new plant, it's kind of like a baby from that mother plant. Um, and I always just thought that that was so interesting that, um, you know, when it comes to like different plants and trees and root systems, just how interconnected and uh, related they can be to each other. Um, so when I think about it that way, it kind of just makes me feel like all warm and gushy inside. Like we should be like plants. Um, and I can <laughs> actually, I'm laughing at you. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about tomatoes again. I think I'm obsessed. <laughs> Uh, I liked how you were describing um, how we attempt to mimic nature to redevelop these plants. And actually over the last few years in my garden, I've actually had uh, tomatoes regrow. We call them volunteers. So any plants that actually regrow that you did not plant yourself um, from year to year, we call them trans we call them uh, volunteers. So over, this might be the third season I've had some volunteer tomato plants that have uh, grown without me. Um, and it's because of that process that Pamia described, the, the tomato plant dropping from, from the plant, the tomato dropping from the plant, rotting, finding its home in the soil, and then coming and then growing uh, once the, all of the conditions were, were right. And that's what, that's also what Pamia is describing when she's talking about regrowing the herbs and, and propagating those uh, herb plants. Yes. Um, so just to regroup um, over everything we went through, we do want to um, open the floor up to any questions um, or even any comments that you guys have. Um, again, we are... Uh, you know, we're still learning, all of us. Um, so if you guys have any techniques that have worked for you, or if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we can go through them. Um, so just to go over the things we went through again today, we talked about potatoes, we talked about sweet potatoes, we talked about um, the allium family again, which is the garlic, the shallots, the onions. Uh, we talked about celery, lettuce, and cabbage, um, as well as herbs and those root vegetables like the carrots and the parsnips and the turnips um, as well. So uh, we wanted to kind of uh, give you guys like a bunch of different things to experiment with um, and to talk about today. But again, this isn't all encompassing. Um, I'm sure there's other vegetables that you can regrow from. These are just like the easiest and most readily available in most of our communities. So we have a few questions that are in the, in the chat. Um, one question from Jahan a little while ago was, do you have any suggestions on setups for in-home growing? Um, yes. So for me, um, I would suggest uh, scoping out um, a windowsill uh, in your home if you have one that gives really great sunlight. Um, this is going to be um, really helpful for any of the plants we talked about, especially those, the ones that grow in water. 
um, because that sunlight is kind of like, it's gonna be its food. So again, where you're growing something in water versus soil, soil is nutrient dense, right? So it has like everything in it um, that a plant needs. But when those plants are growing from that water, the sunlight is where they're getting um, all of those nutrients from. So if you don't have that uh, readily available, it's not going to, uh, to work out well for you. Um, so that's one suggestion that I would have. Sounds good to me. And um, as far as the setup, just to continue to uh, to emphasize that you want to place your place any of these plants that you intend to regrow in a smaller dish and um, shallow water, so the water so the plants do not decompose or rot and continually change the water. That's very very important with these sort of experiments. Um, have a few, we had a, quite a few questions. Um, is it a good time to plant seasonally? So it depends on what you're growing. Um, so every plant in the garden is, has the time of year where it will grow best, so it's seasonality. Uh, but one thing that I have recently come across that I really love the concept is that your fall garden is just your spring garden in the fall. So a lot of the things that grow well in the spring can actually grow well in the fall because they're very similar at those time of years, especially in our climate, are very sim similar um, weather-wise. So it is a good time to plant, but it just depends on what you intend to plant. So in the fall and in the spring, it's more of those cold, hardy uh, vegetables. So like the leafy greens, um, what else would you say? The root vegetables. Oh, yep. Even like the carrots and stuff can still yeah. be there. Uh, but typical summer plants or heat loving plants like peppers and tomatoes and beans, they're, they won't do well during this time of year. So it is a good time to plant. It just depends on what you intend to plant. Right. Um, another thing that probably isn't going to do too well once that first frost hits um, are like your herbs. You know, right. most, most aren't going to uh, be able to survive um, the frost. Ironically, um, you'll see cilantro come out a lot during the spring and summer at the big box stores for people to grow, but cilantro doesn't really like the heat. So you'll get a cilantro plant and it will thrive for a few weeks and then it'll just die. So if you're looking for an herb to grow like right now that'll grow pretty quickly, cilantro is a good one because it actually prefers the cooler weather, but most other herbs won't do very well during this time of year as it gets colder, as when you said, like with the first, the, when the first frost hits. Um, any word of caution when we move the plant from water to soil? Um, yes, so it can be kind of uh, shocking, I've noticed, um, when moving um, the plants that have been sitting in the water to the soil. So for me, uh, what I did was I moved the plants to, uh, as soon as I moved the plant to the soil, I made sure that it was like really wet um, and then started to like wean off on how much like I watered it so it wouldn't be such a shock. So um, the word that I would, that usually gets tossed around when it comes to uh, making that transition is acclimation. So what you wanna do is make sure that that plant gets uh, acclimated properly. So you don't want to uh, shock it uh, too much by placing it just directly in some soil and thinking everything's gonna be okay. You wanna water it as much as possible. Obviously you're not gonna water it so much that it's like, you know, uh, you know, very watery or anything like that. But, you know, you want to start out with a large amount of water and go smaller and smaller and smaller until it's used to being a little bit more dry around those roots. Next question is eggshells good for compost? Eggshells are great for compost. Um, my mother used eggshells for years in her houseplants and she was the queen of having the healthiest house houseplants ever. Um, what my mom's technique was, was she would take eggshells and she would place them, like crush them up and place them in a gallon of water and place water into that and use that water to water all of her plants. Um, I found success with that method, but you can also put eggshells directly into soil, uh, you know, to, to help your plants uh, be more fertilized. And again, they can go uh, directly into compost, but if you put them directly into a compost bin, you just want to make sure that they're really clean and don't have any remnants um, from the inside of the egg on them. Um, one of the reasons for that is, uh, 
plant materials break down a lot differently than um, like other organic materials when it comes to like meat or eggs and things like that. And what you don't want to introduce is, uh, you know, any bad bacteria or anything like that to your compost because um, that can cause some disease issues with plants when you uh, use that compost for the plants themselves. So just a word of caution when it comes to that. Yes. Another question, I live in, a, in an apartment and I don't have access to a balcony any longer or a yard. How does one grow larger root vegetables like potatoes with minimal space? Okay, um, so she says she doesn't have access to a balcony. Um, Erica, do you have access, do you have a window or windowsill that you have access to that you could place a pot in? Um, if you do, you can still do potatoes. Like I've seen potatoes grow um, in pots maybe about like six to 10 inches um, just to give it some root depth. So you don't need a whole lot of space to grow um, like a small potato plant. It can still be done. Uh, it, it might be a little bit um, more difficult um, in terms of, you know, how much space you actually have in that window or placing it like right at the base of the window if it still can get adequate light that way. But um, I don't want to discourage you because it definitely can be done and I have seen it done before. Um, I would definitely suggest that um, you do some research online as well. There's different blogs that um, like are specifically, um, that specifically talk about growing different vegetables in apartment uh, settings. So that could be helpful for you as well. All right, let's see if we have a few more questions. How often, and I'll get to the, um, I see the question about the survey. I just wanted to put that in before everybody left. So I will get back to and explain that, uh, but it is the correct link. How often do you need to add compost to your house plants or garden? So um, if you have a garden, an outdoor garden, you typically would just add compost in the beginning of your season. Um, and the nutrients that are in the compost will continue to fertilize your, uh, fertilize your plants throughout the season. You can give them a boost by doing what's called side dressing your plants with compost once you get into further into the season, let's say like six to eight weeks. Um, but if it's some really nutrient dense compost, you shouldn't need to uh, reapply very often. As Tamia said, like the fertilizers that you see um, at the big box stores that you can uh, that you can purchase that way, they tend to be full filled with chemicals and they don't have like that natural decomposition that might be slower. Yeah, and sometimes like even when they do, like you'll see like a little tagline like, oh, it has natural this or that. It's still things that have been grown like in a lab, you know what I mean? So like they've never had the, like the opportunity to like actually be out in the environment. So things are very different um, that are grown in labs and are, that, are, that come from nature. So when you can, um, I don't wanna tell anybody like don't do this or don't do that because I encourage people to experiment and do what works for them. Um, but just based on scientific evidence and common sense, you know, we wanna use it like what, uh, what we have readily available that's natural when we can versus not. Are there any particular type of pots that are best to use or does it matter, for example, ceramic or plastic? Um, I have a little bit of something I want to say about that. So okay. I, I, like I've done like ceramic, like I've done like, you know, like this one, like it being plastic or what have you. So like uh, research shows that, you know, plastic can and will uh, rub off on anything that it touches. So I'm sure you guys have heard like, oh, don't drink from a plastic water bottle that's been sitting in the sun for a long time um, because plastic tends to break down over time. And so is that going to get into your water bottle? Yes. In the same way it's going to get into your water bottle and then into your water, it's going to come from um, the plastic in the planters into your soil. So, I mean, like, is it something that's gonna like really like affect your health right now? Maybe not, but it is something to consider long-term if we're like consuming the vegetables that are grown in these pots. Um, so I'm saying that to say, if you have house plants that you're not eating from and they're just growing just for beauty, I don't think plastic is an issue whatsoever. However, if you're gonna be eating from those uh, plants um, for the purpose that we're talking about today, I would lean more towards, um, you know, like the natural base, like pots, if you can. So that's going to be like the clay pots. Um, and I really like the clay pots also because they're breathable. Yes. Um, so 
and usually they have like the holes drilled into the bottom and what have you so you have less chance of your plants being like waterlogged or like you know overwatered or things like that because it has that natural like porous element um, to them. And this will be our last question. Thank you for that, Pamia. Um, what are good herbs to replant? Um, so from, from scraps, um, so today we talked about um, what I had here was um, the mint. Um, that's really, really good to regrow and really easy to regrow. Um, I've done it before uh, with basil. Um, oregano is another one that's really easy. Um, and I like all of these because they're like common kitchen herbs, you know what I mean? So as we're creating different recipes for our family, um, it's really great to have those readily available. Um, so it just so happens that the easiest ones are the ones we use the most, <laughs> um, which is pretty cool. But um, those are the ones that I've had success with. And so Pamia dropped this in earlier in the today's lesson, uh, but I wanted to revisit it really quickly. We have a bonus for you. So for everyone who is participating in today's class, we have a recipe that we're going to send you for uh, vegetable broth. Because another way to reuse these kitchen scraps, other than composting them or regrowing them, is to literally reuse them and cook with them. So um, you can take pieces of your, you can take the skin, the stem, the leaves, all parts of the plant or the, the vegetable or the fruit, mostly vegetable because we're talking about uh, you know, vegetable broth that you don't use, you can use them and create vegetable broth. So we have a recipe that we're, we are going to email you for vegetable broth. Um, and it's a particular recipe that calls for um, specific vegetables. But the beauty of it is, with, especially with broth and stock, you can be very creative and throw all types of vegetables and herbs and spices into the mix and create a very delicious, health conscious, money saving broth. So um, the actual picture that is on the recipe is a photo of some vegetable broth that I made that's frozen. <laughs> um, and that's a cool thing too. You can make large batches and you can have plans to cook with it in the moment. And you can also save some for later and put it in the freezer and you're not spending two, three, five dollars every time you need some sort of base for uh, whatever you might be cooking at home. Um, and one of the other reasons that like we chose this recipe is because a lot of times when we buy vegetable broth in the store, pause. I just need to say that I just like can't believe we really buy vegetable broth. And I'm not even pointing a finger. I'm talking about myself too, because it's such a like cheap thing to make and it's so easy and you have access to all of these things. We should just start making our own broths in general. Um, but one of the differences between this broth and broths that you might find in the store is that obviously they're going to be adding um, different additives into these broths so that they have a longer shelf life. Um, and that takes a toll on our health, right? And then a lot of them have a lot of oil in them. They're like oil based. So this recipe is just water and just vegetables. That's it. If you guys add different seasonings into it, um, you can do it at your discretion. Um, and again, like Latiana said, being able to freeze this, um, you can just write a date on it. You know exactly when it was made. You know exactly what it was made from. And you feel a lot better feeding yourself and feeding this stuff um, to your children because you know it's fresh and you know it's healthy. So thank you. Before we're running a little over time, but before we finish up today, we want to acknowledge uh, how we are here with you today, how we're being supported. So this program is being funded through an award from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Mid Atlantic Region, and they are a partner of all of us. So if you click the link that I had put into the chat, you may have already seen that it took you somewhere that you were pretty unfamiliar with. Like, what is this? This is not even what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but the the partner from the partner of the National Network of Libraries of Medicine is a research program called All of Us, um, and it is a program from the National Institutes of Health. And their goal is to build one of the largest, most diverse collection of data of its kind in health research. And it's what they're looking to research and what they're looking to create is learn more about precision medicine. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, you can visit all of us. Uh, you can learn more about it by visiting your website and I'll put that in the chat. Um, but the survey link and the evaluation link is just some is uh, from our funders. So if you can please complete that so our funders know that we are sharing this information with you so we can continue to provide you this, that will be great. 
Um, and another resource that we wanted to share with you other than this specific information from this class is this website called Medline Plus. Um, it's an online health information resource for uh, patients of healthcare and their families and friends from the National um, Network of Library of Medicine. And we use data and information from this. It's such a robust site. So it's very similar to what we, most people are used to with like a WebMD, but Medline Plus is, as I said, way uh, more robust and it has so many different types of um, resources and different health topics that it covers, including health issues like asthma, cancer, diabetes. They have information on, um, drug and supplements that you can get and from you can get as deep as actual research studies and as informal as uh, newsletters. So it's very easy to read information. As I said, Pamia and I, we use this as a tool and a resource to gather information when we're developing our lesson plans. So this is another resource that you can put in your toolkit as you consider your health and wellness uh, for you and your family. So thank you for your time, everyone. If we can see your faces, if you want to, before we say goodbye, yes, I'll reshare the link. We love seeing everyone. Um, and here, hey baby. Hey, baby. <laughs> hey Riz. Hi, ladies. Thank you. You're welcome, <laughs> Callie. You joined us. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sharing the link again, and I'll share it in the email when I send over the uh, the recipe as well. Hi, Dominique. Dana has been with us the whole time. Hi, Dana. <laughs> Love it. Because <laughs> it's like sometimes it's like, okay, we're just talking to a bunch of black screens, you know, but like we love to see people too. So. <laughs> You're welcome. So hey, hey, I didn't just realize Irene was here. Hey, Irene. Yes, and I saw her face for a little bit. Hey, Erica. Hi, Dominique. All right, thank y'all for obliging us with your faces. <laughs> oh, and one last thing. Um, if you guys do decide to um, try any of the experiments or you do decide to try the recipe, um, feel free to let us know how it went on our Facebook page. Um, we'd love to have feedback. Um, and, you know, uh, if you guys uh, find any uh, techniques that work better for you um, or worse for you, please share that as well because um, we're building a community and we want to learn from each other as well. Yes, so follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, Black Girls with Green Thumbs. Send us pictures, tag us, just show us what you're doing. We have shirts too. Yes, uh, I was going to show you mine too. <laughs> yeah, you'll find that link. Um, if you guys like the shirts, so you think they're cute, you can, uh, you can purchase one for yourself or for someone else you love. Um, we're going to send you all all the links. So we'll send you the links for the survey. We'll send you the recipe. We'll send you links for uh, our website and all the social media and the link for the merch. That'll help to continue to support us as well. So thank you all. We're about 12 minutes over time. So thanks for hanging with us. And we'll see you next month, third Saturday of the month. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks again. Bye. Bye-bye.